Hey, what is up, everyone? Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles. I am Donnie, your host, and with me, as always, is a man who knows when he's dressed up, he has his pants tucked into his shirt. <laughs> it's Dale. What's happening, man? How you, bud? I'm good. I'm all tucked in and looking good. All right. <laughs> formal, I reckon. <laughs> that's your that's your formal wear right there. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> you got any shout outs for us this week, dude? Oh, we got a few. How about this? Well, uh, shout out to our old buddy Jeremy Navy and Shelby. We appreciate you being one of our one of our best friends and a good a uh, good fan, friend of the show. Always wearing a sticker and supporting us. And uh, good shout out to uh, Tam McDale out in Missouri. She uh, just found us the other day and gave us a little holler, and so I'll give her a shout out and. Uh, we want to give a big thanks out to Kelly from uh, Carolina Crime Podcast for the awesome review she gave us. Oh, you guys, uh, please check out her podcast because it's really good. And uh, thanks so much, Kelly. We appreciate the support. Absolutely. All right, is that all the housekeeping we got, or we got anything else we want to talk about? Well, I guess that well, we could always holler out through our merch and stuff. So uh, you know, we got a few T-shirts and stuff online. Go out and check us out. Go to our website and look up under the merch or the store and. Got a few t shirt designs, coffee cups, that kind of mess, and see what you like. If you like something, pick it up, help and, us out. And we've got some more designs we're coming out with that we're going to try to get on there for our fans to have. And, and just remind them, you know, check us out and give us a review. You know, whatever pl- platform you listen to, click that five star button. It does help. It does. All right. Dale, we're going to get into this week's episode. All righty. And this is the murder of Faith Hedgepath. And we've been on the fence about this episode for a while, wanting to do it back and forth, whether we were going to do it, whether we were not going to do it. And it's a troubling case, and I'm, we talked about it, and I know it bothered you a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and just the the whole case in itself is kind of disturbing, and it hadn't been solved, so we're going to get into it, and maybe somebody knows something about her. Yeah, I'm sure somebody knows something. All right, like we said, this is Faith Hedgepath, and she was born on September the 26th, 1992. And Dale, she was a member of the Hollowa Saponi Native Tribe, which is recognized by the state of North Carolina as an Indian tribe. And this is in Warren County, and it's part of the tribe's traditional territory. Now, when Faith was young, uh, Less than a year old, her parents divorced. Mm. Yeah. And she was raised by her mother with the help of an older sister there in Warrington. And Connie Hedgepath, who was Faith's mother, named her daughter Faith because, you know, she believed that's what she was going to need because she had other children. She had two sons and a daughter with a husband with a drug problem. So she was going to... She had her hands full. Yeah. She needed help. Everything I've read and heard on her, Faith was really a blessing. Just a very outgoing child, wasn't a problem child or anything like that. You know, even in high school, Faith was an honor student, a cheerleader, and belonged to many clubs and organizations. And she did pretty well academically. Right. And Dale, she even earned the Gates Millennium Scholarship. This is a scholarship that is put out, you know, for higher education programs and it's available to high achieving ethnic minority students in the United States. And it's funded by the Microsoft founder, Bill Gates, him and his wife, Bill and Melinda Gates. So it's pretty good. Pretty you know, good scholarship. Yeah, and this even paid for her college and graduate school. Mm-hmm. So she was she was rock solid through graduate school. Right. To have it paid for. So this was a big deal. Faith was gonna be the first one of her family to go to college or even graduate college. Her father attended UNC Chapel Hill, but he dropped out. And Faith, it was her dream to go to Chapel Hill. Yeah. Even as a young child, that's where she wanted to go. Yeah, I think one of her teachers also went to Chapel Hill, and I think they had a connection yeah. with that as well. Yeah, and she was even considering either be a, a, a pediatrician or a, or a teacher. Right. I think those were her two goals. She hadn't decided yet. And her first two years at Chapel Hill went pretty good for her. And she took the spring 2012 semester off. I I don't know even I don't know why she did that. I know she was working two jobs. Right. I don't know if she needed money or you know even though you got your school paid for that money goes just towards school. Right. So still have to have a place to live and 
eat and that kind of stuff. Yes, right? yeah, you have to live. That's right. But even though she took the semester off, she remained in Chapel Hill over the summer, and she was living in an off-campus apartment, and it was called the Hawthorne at the View Complex. And, Dale, this is between Chapel Hill and Durham, and it's pretty much on the county line, I think, between Durham and Orange County, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And she planned to move into another apartment after her financial aid for the fall semester was made available to her. And she shared this apartment with a a good friend of hers that she had been friends with since her freshman year, and her name was Karina Rosario. And Karina's boyfriend, his name was Eric Tacoy Jones. And so we're going to hear a lot more about these guys just a little bit later on. Right. Now, Dale, the relationship between Jones and Rosario had gotten violent. Yeah. Pretty violent. Even to the point she ended, she ended it and he had to move out. And in early July 2012, he even attempted to break into the apartment twice. Right. And it, even one time after Rosario had changed the locks. Yeah, he'd even come in, kick the door down, and pushed her down to the ground over a tub or something, broke it in pieces. And I think that's when they went to go see if they get something done about it. Yeah, and Faith eventually took Rosario to get a restraining order against him, to, you know, to get him to stay away from the apartment. Right. And Jones reportedly resented Faith's influence over his girlfriend. So, oh, I'm sure he's going to be mad yeah, about that. Yeah, like she was telling her you know she don't need to be around him and it's and, not good for you basically yeah he was yeah bad for her and at one point he even reportedly threatened faith during a phone call even to kill her if he could not get back with karina right yeah. so i'm sure that was emotional rage just pissed off because he kind of blocked her blocked him from his girlfriend so he's you know but i don't know yep all right dale we're going to jump ahead a little bit to September the 6th, 2012, and this was a Thursday. And about 5.45 p.m., Faith attended a rush event for the campus chapter of Alpha Pi Omega. And this was a Native American sorority that she was hoping to join. And about 7.15 that evening, she left, saying that she had to work on a paper. She was writing about the history of her tribe. Her... And Karina Rosario went to the university's library, which is Davis Library, to study together at about 8 p.m. And sometime between 8.30 and 9, she exchanged texts with her father about her hopes of joining the sorority. Now, Faith left Rosario there briefly and returned about 11.30, which they returned to their apartment arriving around midnight. A half hour later, they left, heading to a nightclub called The Thrill. Now, this nightclub is now closed. Yeah. But that's where they were going. And it was in downtown Chapel Hill. And they admitted customers under the legal drinking age of 21 to right. dance. Yeah. And there wasn't a lot of these clubs around, but this was one of them that would, that would allow them to do that. And the two women arrived at the Thrill about 12.40 a.m. Almost an hour and a half of dancing, Karina Rosario told police later that she was having an upset stomach and wanted to leave. And security cameras at the club show her and Faith leaving around two, around 2.06 that morning. And the last, I think this was the last visual record of Faith of her presence anywhere before yeah. she was before yeah. she was killed. There's footage of them going into the club and then footage of them coming out and that's about all we get. But looking at the club the club video of them going in and out, it doesn't look like anyone is mad or upset or anything like that. No, actually I was talking to the bouncer on the way in. He opens the door for them, lets them in and stuff and then when they came out they're just standing there talking for a minute before they leave. Yeah. Him and a couple of guys I believe it was. Nothing looked like out of no, out of the ordinary to me. Yeah. It looked you know, it's typical evening or early morning. Now, Dale, by 3 a.m., Faith and Karina had returned to their apartment. And a woman who lived below the two of them was awake watching television, and she heard three thumping noises, which she described as like a heavy bag being dropped or 
furniture being moved. Hmm. And shortly after that, Faith Facebook page was also accessed around that time. Now, at about 3.40 a.m., a text message was sent from Faith's phone to a guy named Brandon Edwards. Now, Brandon, he was a former boyfriend of hers. Of Corinne's? Of Faith's. Oh, Faith's. Yeah. And he was saying, the text message said, Hey, B. And we're going to put pictures of this online on our social media, but the text message said, Hey, B, like a lowercase b. Can you come over here, please? Rosario needs you more. Aha. You know. Please let her know you care. Now, just a few minutes later, another text was sent from Faith's phone to Edwards with one single word, and it was the word than. And some people believe this was a correction. Yeah, looks like she just left that out the first one. Or something. I mean, I do that sometimes. Yeah. Autocorrect changes something, and yeah. you have to send a different word. I mean, I, I texted you today with something, and, left, and it left a word out. Right. And I had to go back and add the word in. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it happens to a lot of people. And a lot of people believe that word is for the word aha that was in the text. And this was the last evidence of any activity on her phone. Now, at about 4.16 a.m., Brandon Edwards sent a text, returning text, asking who had sent the previous text. Hmm. Now, Karina's phone record shows that she was trying to call Edwards at around that time, and he didn't answer. And when he did not answer, she tried to call a guy named Jordan McCrary. Now, Jordan was a UNC Chapel Hill soccer player that she'd known at the time. And at 425, she left the apartment to go get in McCreary's car. Yeah. So how do we know these times are exact? Or do we know how? Is this just probably with their, the phone, their account? The phone pings, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah, that's probably what they've done. They checked that. So that's, that's pretty accurate. Okay. Now, Rosario said later she believes Faith was asleep in her room and left the apartment door unlocked. Why? Would you leave someone asleep with the apartment door unlocked? At 4.30 in the morning? Yes. I don't know. That, that That's one of the things that bothers me about this. And I did hear one thing where it said that maybe they only had one key and they did that sometimes. But you wouldn't do it at 4.30 in the morning. You know where the other girl was in the bed. I mean, maybe if you were running to the store and I knew you was going to be home in 30 minutes or an hour, but right before I got back, then maybe I would do that. But in the middle of the night, that ain't happening. Didn't no. Because she knew she was going to be there when she came back the next day because she called her to have her come pick her up. But, I mean, I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself, but but I don't know. That that part really bothers me. I mean, even if you only had one key, hide the key. Have a hiding place. That's better than leaving a door unlocked. Hell, take it with you. I mean, <laughs> if I'm home, I don't need the key. Yeah. Lock the door. I don't, yeah. That, that's, yeah, that's baffled me, too. Yeah, I don't know. I don't like it. Now, Jordan McCreary drove Karina Rosario to the home of another acquaintance on West Longview Street there in Chapel Hill. And she put the time of her arrival there at around 4.30 a.m. And after spending the rest of the night in the early morning there, a short time later, it was about 10.30, uh, she tried to arrange a ride back to her apartment there at the Hawthorne at the View. And after attempting to reach Faith, and she didn't answer so Karina called another friend named Marisol Rangel, who came and took her to her apartment. And this is one thing that baffles me, too, both of them being back at the apartment, which we're going to get into. Right. When they arrived there, it was just shortly before 11 a.m., they entered the apartment and called for Faith, and she didn't respond. Now, Dale, in her bedroom, they found the bloody-bodied, wrapped in a quilt, partially nude, and they dialed 911 to call the police. And we've got that 911 call right here. Yep. 11.01 a.m. 44 seconds, September 7, 2012. <laughs> Dara 911, where is your emergency? I, um, I just walked into my apartment and my friend was just like, you unconscious. 
Okay, what's your address, ma'am? I live at Hawker after you. Um, give me give me the address. I just I just moved here. I'm about to get it. Oh my god. It's um five six three nine old Capitol Hill Road in Durham. Okay, repeat it to me so repeat it to me so I make sure I've got it correct. Okay. Five six three nine old Capitol Hill Road. It's a Okay, what's it? No two. Sixteen oh two? Yes. What's the phone number you're calling from? Two zero one three two one eight zero seven five. Okay, you say your friend is unconscious? He's unconscious. I just walked in the apartment and there looks like there's blood okay, everywhere. Okay, listen to me. Okay, listen to me. Listen to me. Somebody's already sure. sending me ambulance. Okay, I need to get some information from you, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna help. I'm gonna tell you how to help her. Okay. 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 I how how old is your How old is she? She's nineteen. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't okay. want to touch her, but. Listen to me. Is is she breathing? I don't know. You need to check and see. Is she breathing? She. I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay, listen to me. There's blood everywhere. There's what? There's blood everywhere. Okay. I don't know what happened. Okay, is she on her back or is she on her laying on her stomach? She's on on her back, but like I think she fell off the bed because she's like off the bed. There's blood all over the pillows, like in the comforter. I just don't know what happened. Okay. All right, listen to me, all right? Is someone coming? Yes, I've got somebody coming. I've got somebody coming. I need for you to help her. I need for you to go up to her. We need to see if she's breathing or not. Okay? I think so. Okay. Listen to me. Go up. The paramedics are on their way. I want you to stay on the line. I'm going to tell you what to do next, all right? Are you right by her now? Yes. Okay. Listen carefully. She's not moving. Okay. No. Will you touch her arm? Tell me how does she feel. She's not moving. Okay, ma'am. We need to find out if we can help her or not. You've got to, you know, do as I'm asking so we can help her. All right? Okay. Okay. If you can, lay her flat on her back. Remove any pillows. Lay her flat on her back? Flat on her back. Remove any pillows. Okay. Okay. Kneel next to her. Look in her mouth for food or vomit. Okay, kneel next to her and look in her mouth for food or vomit. Tell me something. Listen to me. Listen to What is your name? I'm sorry. I'm really It's okay, honey. It's okay, honey. Listen to me. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Listen to me. When you touch her, how does she feel? Does she feel warm? No, she feels cold. She feels cold? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Don't touch anything else, okay? Don't touch anything else. Okay. They're on their way. I've got police on the way to you, and I've got got medics on the way. Okay? I can't believe this. Okay. What room is she in? She's in my bedroom. Okay. I want you to go back into the living room, okay? You I need don't to go know in. what's going on. Like, okay, listen, listen to me. in my room that, like, was not here before. Okay, listen like to me. someone came in here. Okay, okay. It really does. All right, what, what did like you say your name was again? Here because <laughs> okay, I don't... Okay, listen to me. Do, don't touch anything else in the room. I'm not I want touching. you to leave, leave that room and go into the living room. You I need did. to make sure make sure the door is unlocked so somebody can get in, so that the medics 
and the police can get in when they get there. Okay? Yeah, it's unlocked. It's unlocked. Okay, now tell me again. get here, though. Okay, they're on their way, honey. They're coming as fast yeah. as they can. You just stay on the phone with me, all right? I am. Okay, tell me again what your name is. It looks like someone has been in there because she's okay. not like the cell. I don't know what Okay, okay. Is. I've let them know. We've got everybody on the way to help you. Now, tell me again what your name is. What? What is your name? Karina Rosario. Karina? Yes. Okay, Karina. You just yes. you sit down on the couch and don't touch anything, okay? You just sit down. I'm not touching anything. Okay, okay. I just want you to sit down because the the police and the medics are going to be there. Just They're coming just okay. as fast as they can, all right? Okay. You just you just stay on the phone with me. Okay. okay. <laughs> you just stay on the phone with me. Are you sure there's something? Yes, ma'am. They are on their way. I just can't believe this. No, someone has to have been in there. Okay. We've got we've got first responders on the way. There's a fire truck coming. There's a medic coming, and the sheriff's department's on the way to you. Okay. okay. You just stay on the phone with me until somebody gets there with you. All right? Okay. Okay, Karina. How old are you, Karina? I'm 20. You're 20? Okay, hon. You're doing all right. You're doing all right. You just stay on the I phone with me. I see the police. You see the police? Yes. Okay. You let me know when they get in there with you, and then you can talk to them, all okay. right? I just don't want you to be alone right now. Okay. Okay. You just stay on the phone with me. Okay. Are they in there with you? They coming in? Yes. Thank you. Okay, honey. All right. Bye bye. Right. Right. We're gonna talk about the nine one one call, Dale. Okay. Now, the news and observer reporter named Tom Gasparoli, he covered this case extensively. He he's even got a podcast on this. It's like a maybe a ten part series on it is, this. It is excellent. It is an extent. And it is very de- it is more detailed than we're going to get into on this case. Yeah, we don't have that kind of time, but definitely go check it out. If you're interested in this after we get done a little more, and definitely check his out. It's, it's very informative. And he also devoted most of his own blog to pondering this case and keeping the case alive. So yeah. kudos to him for doing this. And uh, he even raised a lot of questions on Rosario. Yeah. On the girl who made the 911 call. And he even said to me, the whole call smells fishy. His quote was, the whole call reeks of unusual. Yeah, and I guess if you're used to checking that stuff out or you know or you listen to tons of them, you could probably pick out details quicker than if you don't hear them very often. To to me, it's not really that unusual. There's a few things here and there, but as far as the whole thing – like they pick it apart is way different than I would listen to it myself because I really think how would I react if I walk in and seen what she saw. Yeah. And I don't know how I would make a 911 call if I walked in on it. I don't know how I'd do that. My my manner would be my my whole demeanor. Right. Because this ain't know. like she just walked in and the girl ain't breathing. This is major damage. Yeah. I mean, major damage. Yeah. She was torn up pretty bad. And even Gasparelli raised the possibility that Rosario's friend, Marisol Rangel, whose voice sounds to him to be like the caller. Uh, and I agree, because I heard her on another, uh, inter- it's like a news story that we found, and we'll try to link that up to you so you can check that out. But to me, when they talk to her on there, her voice sounds very similar to me. Yeah. Uh as the 911 caller and even on the 911 tape as you heard it took several times when she asked her what her name is before she ever gives her name it's like she's kind of dodging that question 
you know, and I don't know how I would react if somebody they were asking my name and how upset I would be. But, I, but yeah, she yeah, went. True. Okay. But she went several times being asked of who is this, right? What's your name? And and the caller does not mention face name in the call at all. That lasts nearly eight minutes. Hmm. Face name, face name, not even mentioned at all. Only describing the body that she's come upon as her friend. Right. So that's yeah. And even Gasparilli asked, does a caller seem reluctant to touch face body? Well, yeah, and that's here or there. And I understand they're thinking, well, it's your friend. You want to do all you can to help her out. But when you come in and she's, I don't know how, I don't really. When she's been beat to death with a, with a liquor bottle, it's not going to be a pretty sight. No, I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't want to go into all that. But Yeah, she was bludgeoned over the head several times with a rum bottle yeah and this bottle was found at site and the bottle had even been tested and it wouldn't didn't break at all Mm -hmm. one just like it wouldn't even didn't crack or anything yeah yeah she had been sexually assaulted and beat to death blood force trauma yeah anyway we'll get to that yeah now among the evidence collected was a note near faith's body with the text that said I'm not stupid, bitch, jealous. And when I heard that on his podcast, I'm picturing it in my head where I was like, well, that's pretty weird. And then you actually see it. We'll post a picture of it. It's like somebody has torn a piece of a fast food bag, like a white bag, and it's all crumpled up. And it's it's written really strangely. Like they even say it's like somebody's trying to disguise their handwriting. And it's three lines, you know, like it says, I'm not stupid. And then underneath that, it says bitch. And then underneath that, it says jealous, correct? Correct. Yeah, and so it's really a strange note and the fact that it has no blood on it whatsoever when pretty much everything else in the room does. It's, it's a strange piece of evidence. And even the police even go so far as to say they believe the bag may have come from a restaurant called Time Out, hmm. which was a popular 24-hour restaurant there in Chapel Hill. Okay. So the only place that had been open at that hour. So I wonder if the rest of the bag was in there somewhere. Has that ever been? This never been brought up. But well, the, this is a weird looking piece. Of, it's like somebody had a wadded up piece of paper and wrote on it. That's what they, it looks like. They, yeah, they tore it off and it was written in ballpoint pen. Yeah. So it could have come from anywhere. It could have come from the trash can for all we know. But that's true. And, it, and like I, at first, I thought maybe it was it could have been written at any time and just thrown in there. But if it was on the bed, it's kind of purposely put i would think and even investigators have said whether or not they've had the handwriting analyzed yeah and a lot of people think it sounds more like something that a, a lady would say instead of a guy mm-hmm. just uh yeah yeah that's true and the website crime watch daily had an expert named peggy walla and took photos of the note and she noted that it was clean of blood mm-hmm. had no blood on it whatsoever even though there was blood all over the bed the comforter the liquor bottle. There was no blood on this note. We well, saw Dexter. You know what happens when <laughs> exactly. I mean, it goes everywhere. Yeah, splatter goes everywhere, and this is suggesting that it was written away from the crime scene or beforehand, and placed there. Right. So I don't know. That's kind of that's a, just a fishy piece of yeah. evidence, I think. And even Walla believes that the writer was, you know, even maybe used a non-dominant hand to write the note. Right. And even like a like a homicidal rage, like by being called stupid or something. And the word stupid even especially looks to Gasparelli like it might have been written separately under the words. As if it had been written more clearly off to the side. Right. It's just a strange looking beast. Yeah. So but yeah, like Dale said, we're gonna post pictures on all this on our our social media accounts. Now, Dale Details of the investigation were not discussed publicly at first, and a deviation from the Chapel Hill's police usual practice, the town obtained a court order sealing all records on this case. Police collected semen from the scene and used it to develop a DNA profile. Right. And there was uh, semen found on Karina's body and in other places of the apartment. Right, and a rape kit from what i've heard yes so she had been reported that she had been raped and the autopsy determined that faith faith had died from blunt force trauma to the head which is likely 
like we said, being hit by the empty rum bottle. Not just once. It yeah. was bad. At the very beginning, Eric DeCoy Jones seemed to be a very strong suspect. Well, of course. He threatened yeah. the killer. I mean, yeah, exactly. And police even learned of his history of domestic violence and the threat against Faith. They also found that the night before, around 6 p.m., he had texted an acquaintance asking for forgiveness for what I am about to do. So, yeah, it's just weird. Yeah. And then posted the same message on his Twitter feed. Hmm. Now, three days later, he changed the banner on his Facebook page to read, Dear Lord, forgive me for all my sins and the sins I may commit today. Protect me from the girls who don't deserve me and the ones who wish me dead today. Yeah. That's, what the hell? <laughs> that, is, that is creepy. Now, now, police sought a DNA sample from Jones, who they, can, like I said, considered a person of interest. After some initial resistance, he even complied. His DA, DNA did not match the sample from the apartment, and they excluded him as a suspect. Now, DNA from Edwards and many other men whom police had found at the thrill during, you know, during that time right. also tested with the same result, no match at all. Now, just days, the university's board of trustees and the local Crime Stoppers chapter and the Hollowa Saponi tribe and the apartment complex had offered a combined $29,000 in reward money for information leading to an arrest. Police hoped the reward money would lead to a quick resolution of the case, and it hadn't turned to be anything. And even in 2008, the murder of Eve Carson, who at the time at Chapel Hill was an undergrad student, you know, her body, there was a $25,000 reward that led to the killer's arrest. And even uh, two the, months later, the yeah. officer of uh, Governor Bev Perdue added another ten grand to the reward for Hitchbeth's killer. Yeah. You know, the, still today, there's there's nothing. It's just crazy to me that they've, I mean, they was pretty thorough, I guess. They must have pretty much, I mean, that's a lot of people to check, and they don't have nothing, and it just blows my mind. Yep. Now, the following month, Chelsea Delaney, who was a reporter, had originally covered the case in the newspaper The Tar Heel, wrote an article uh, taking a skeptical look at the ceiling of the case. And she speculated that SEAL's reveal purpose was to conceal early missteps used by the Chapel Hill police who might not have been, you know, done enough to handle the investigation. And even the town's court filing, she noted, revealed that the first two months of the investigation, no new search warrants had been sought. And she even was quoted to say, we have to ask, how hot is it? Ask one of the lawyers representing the media. And Delaney talked to the residents of the apartment at the Hawthorne at the View, and they told they told her that during the preceding summer, they saw, strongly suspected the domestic violence, later reported by Rosario and Jones. And they thought the police presence on the day of the body was found was related to that until they learned otherwise. Hmm. That's even the neighbors even suspecting that. Right. So it looks kind of fishy, fishy to me. Yeah. This is the same neighbor who uh, said after the police had left when they saw her, uh, Rosario just coming down the steps, texting, didn't seem upset too much at mm-hmm. all. Yep. Yeah. Now, some more evidence that came to light later on, Dale. A friend of Faith's shared with police a long conversation perhaps inadvertently recorded when Faith's phone pocket dialed them on the night before the murder. And they thought this might have some bearing on the case. And it consisted of a three-way conversation, three minutes long, between what sounds like to be Faith and a male and a female with music in the background. And it was time-stamped 1.23 a.m. when the night timeline that faith was at the thrill yeah i think it was two guys two guys faith and then another female mm-hmm. yeah okay and i i think i've read too where some point they thought that the the time stamp had gotten off by the cell company yeah she said that the phone that she had sometimes don't well i guess she didn't say it but <clears throat> they said that sometimes the phone the model that faith had 
that was a common occurrence that some had happened where it would uh the time stamp on um voicemails and stuff would be incorrect yeah but it wasn't proven but it had happened before mm-hmm. and <clears throat> this call was mostly inaudible and you couldn't i mean i listened to it and, and i couldn't make out anything on it no, it's, no. If you've ever had one, and I'm most most people who's got a phone has had one, so it's sometime or another where somebody's called you and didn't mean to, and maybe stuck their phone back in their back pocket, and you're listening to it, and it's just a, a lot of uh, squelch sounding, squealing and squabbles and muffles and wolf, 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 and stuff like that. Like, it's it's similar, yeah, Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown stage, yeah, we're on the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, wah, 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 but wah. It's, it's similar to that, and maybe if we find that, we'll post it. I don't know if we can find a, a whole copy of it, but. We definitely can put up uh, the translation or what the guy thinks he hears in it. But I, myself, I'm, I'm like you. I don't hear a whole lot of anything in it. And it's kind of like the ones you get, and you go, and what the hell is this? And, you know. Now, Crime Watch Daily <clears throat> hired an audio expert, like Dale said, a guy named Arlo West. And this guy, he specializes. He's supposed in, to be the best. In enhancing such recordings. And he claimed he heard Faith crying for help while a male says, I think she's dying, and a female says, do it anyhow. The male and female use the name Eric and Rosie, which is Rosie's, I mean, which is Rosario's nickname. Right. So it could be. I mean, yeah. And this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier is about, you know, they're thinking the timestamp was off, but the cops, I think, were saying, well, the timestamp is what it is, and that's what it is. And so it would be at the time they were in the club, if that was true. But, like we said, when we saw him on the, the video footage leaving the club, it didn't seem like anyone was upset with anyone. And then of all that stuff that was going on, supposedly going on in that, that recording, you would probably look a little different while you were leaving. Or you wouldn't, you would just left by yourself or, or something. It was, there's a whole lot of going on in this conversation that makes me believe that it did not happen in the club. Yeah. And there's no, uh, like, music or glasses or anything you hear like if you ever had anybody call you or at the bar and at a bar much less a dance club you know you can hear lots going on oh yeah and it's hard to hear and there's none of that in the conversation inside all the squilching and squawking yep and even faith's father is convinced that it was recorded his daughter's death and even arlo west agrees with that mm. so that must be tough to hear the website informed chapel hill police of arlo west's findings and they agreed to consider West's enhanced version and evaluate it. But due to the time of the message, they do not believe it to be recording of the killing. Right, because they kill. They're still going by the time They're going by the time stamp, yeah. And the music in the background further suggests it was rec- recorded at the thrill. Yeah, I don't hear no music. Yeah. But I don't, yeah, we'll try to post a, an audio link of that. Now, on September the 23rd, 2016 episode of the abc news program 2020 uh, chapel hill police released an image generated by parabon nano labs and this is a genetic testing company in reston virginia and this they released of what they thought is the suspect who left the semen sample and what he might look like purely based on the phenotype in his dna profile now parabon's president told abc that snapshot, that's the program company used to create this image, predicts eye color, hair color, skin color, freckling, face morphology, and ancestry. And the image included a chart listing and the probability that the suspect had the traits he was assigned. So basically they're saying we can give you a picture of what we think by the DNA code this guy would look like. Or, yeah. or similar to and we're going to post a picture of this also right and according to the image the suspect was very strongly native american and european mixed ancestry or latino basically dark skin and biller. yeah <laughs> most of his genetic markers pointed to mexican colombian and with some south american and native countries making up the balance and parabon believe with over 80 percent confidence that the suspect would have a skin tone in the olive range. Right. With very few freckles and none of... Or none at all. Or none at all, and black hair. 
and it did not make any predictions on his height and weight. Right, and I've heard a lot of people talking about this. You know, saying this sometimes this uh, Parabon thing they look exactly like who you're looking for, and then sometimes they're not even close. Yeah, and then basically on like if they show you a face, and then if the fellow's three hundred pounds, it's not going to look the same as if he, if he weighed a buck twenty five. You know, so it's kind of it, it's kind of all you all we got basically is what what we're looking at. You know, because. Mm-hmm. After all those other tests and having nothing, at least they got something to put out there, you know, a good start. But so far, it still hasn't helped out. Yep. All right, Dale. Do we want to get into some theories now? Yeah, uh, I think so. It's just a lot of stuff going on here. Yeah. And the Chapel Hill Police, they they haven't named any suspects or even per- persons of interest in the case. But they have stated they do not believe the killing was a, a crime of opportunity no, I don't, by a stranger. I don't, I don't believe that either. And they they are strongly believing that it was someone within her group. I think it's someone that knows her. Yeah, or someone I believe that with that. somebody know her. Because I don't know. We you know we've been through a lot of talked about a lot of killers and a lot of stuff that's happened to people. And I don't know if it's I don't. Uh, it just seems like a crime of rage to me to take a bottle and beat somebody to death with it. It's I don't know. <laughs> this this case bothers me, man. And then rape them, leave them half nude, yeah, wrapped up in a yeah. uh, an, uh, comforter, and then throw a note on top of it. Yeah, there's a lot of this. Like I told you before, this case has got a lot of evidence. There's a lot of suspects with nothing whatsoever to go on. Now, Dale, uh, there's some speculation that's focused on Karina Rosario and. You know, which was her roommate at the time, due to her nine one one call, and the last text sent from Faith's phone. And like you said, you know that Marisol Rangel sounds a lot like a lot like, like that one nine one one caller. A lot like her. Yeah, I'm not convinced at all that the text that came from her phone that night that she did it. I don't know. It's just all weird to me. This whole thing weird. I think. I mean, I don't know none of these people, and I know this is an open case, and this is all the stuff going on, but this this little girl deserves some justice. I think, uh, I really think uh, Rosario is in on it somehow or another. I don't know. She just acts weird. She she just bailed, left town. She's they've they've talked to her a ton, you know, what ten times I think mm-hmm. for many hours. So basically, they're not getting what they want from her, like she's hiding something. I don't I don't know. And this is just all my speculation purely, but. I don't buy the fact that this is just some cat that was sitting in the car to sit there and watch them all night and wait for somebody to come out and leave the door unlocked so he could go in and do what he wanted to do. It just I don't I don't believe that at all. Mm-hmm. I guess what one thing that got me on this case was listening to interviews with Faith's father, Roland. He this guy pours his heart and soul into it, and I mean it's his, it's his baby. And yeah. I, I can't even imagine what he's went through but just listen to him talk about it 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 got me yeah, yeah. That, that was the one thing that got me about this case was him yeah yeah i don't know what happened they of course they don't know what happened but i think there's a lot of people that are involved i don't think maybe this took away guys involved maybe he wasn't there or maybe he didn't do it or he didn't do part of it but i, I don't know and, and there's so much uh, i don't know around you know and i don't think anybody that they know or in their circle was even close to the the photo they came up with that they could say was close to yeah now she did have a boyfriend that you know that came down that was in her tribe that come down and hung out some but i don't think he was uh that type of person that you know Mm -hmm. he used to i think he might have been in love with her and just come to see her or whatever but and I think he was even planning on asking him, asking her to marry him. Yeah, wasn't that he? was a uh, you know one of the speculations. That even and nobody ever said what she had said to him or whatever. If he did, but I don't know. So somebody just beat this girl to death, and it's it's just sad. Yep, it is a sad story. But you know, like I say, the the case is still active, and, yeah. and they're still looking for any leads or anything to help solve it. And you know, even one little piece of information could break this case. Just right. one little thing. And if anyone has any information, no matter, you know, if they think it's insignificant, you know, call them. Call the Chapel Hill, Carborough, UNC Crime Stoppers. Yep. And 
Tell them what you know. It's just hard to believe that nobody nobody's come forward. I mean, I think somebody knows something. And everything's fishy. The girl's fishy. The the, the Coy Jones guy's fishy. Uh, I don't know. And like when they left the club at two o six, they got back according to the neighbor around three a.m. So there's an hour just kind of like missing there. So I don't know how far exactly this club was from their their place, but it couldn't be too far. I don't think if they waited to go. 12 40 or whenever it was and went yep yeah got there almost one o'clock stayed till two o'clock and didn't get home till three and then she, she heard a bunch of stuff going on at three moving furniture so it's i don't know it's even possible that everything was done to this little girl before they ever left and that's why she left the door unlocked just because she had have a cover why else would you go oh yeah i left the door unlocked that's just weird. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess there was no sign of forced entry, so she had to say it. But it's like when you we talked off the air about this. If you know, if they only had one key, like if you sleep, take the key with you. Yeah, don't make leave sense. it lock the door, or find a, a common hiding place for a key. Right. You know, that's better than leaving a door unlocked. At least you gonna give a burglar time to look for a key. Yeah, we'll lock it and put it in their car. Yeah, because according to, I mean, they went in face car, so she had a car. She could have got her keys and locked her car, put the house key in there, put the keys back in the house, and locked the door. That whole leaving the door unlocked thing—that's I don't know, blows my mind. Yep, it does. All right, Dale. Anything? Any last words you want to add to this before we get out of here? Uh, no, I just, uh, I just wish you that they could solve this case. I hate it running her dad. That just breaks my heart when I hear those those comments from him and this is his baby girl and they were pretty close and i got daughters so i know how it is and that's one of the reasons this case is pretty hard for me because it's just such a violent violent death this girl she was such a promising young lady and was gone she had so much so much more to do and her future was so bright she's such a smart girl and was going to go back and do great things for her tribe and all to end like this is just it's just sad man and it breaks my heart just some last words that's Tom Gasparoli, who was a reporter, he even wrote that it sounds like to me Karina Rosario has been in the crosshairs as a key figure who knows more than she knows. I think so. Everything about her is fishy. I don't know. Just uh, them being friends and I don't know. It's kind of like she said that she didn't feel good at the club. That's why she wanted to go back. But as soon as they get home, she starts calling dudes looking for a hookup. Well, I assume that's what it's for. I mean, why else is she going to come home and start texting the guys, you know, at, let's see, at uh, unless she was 15 using, to 4 in the morning. And, unless she's using Faith's phone to just get a cover. Right. That's true. Yeah. Plus, it said that uh, she was calling this Brandon fella from her own phone at the same time these texts were going out. So, I don't think that Faith was texting this fella. So, I, like I told you before, she could have done everything when all this – so-called furniture was moving around all that could be going on right then and everything could have been done and this little girl could have been dead before they ever left now they said that time of death was somewhere around 4 30 to 11 to 11 but i don't know can you pinpoint it that close to be you know a little bit of an hour you know, off, I, don't, you know? I don't know how close they can pinpoint that but you know and they may be going off phone pings and things like that when people left and coming and going when Karina was leaving. But, you know. It's such a violent death, man. Yeah. And I just hope it's solved one day. Yeah, me too. I hope uh, people like us and keep talking about it and pushing it out there, maybe somebody will come forward one day. I think somebody knows something. Me too, bud. All right, we're going to get out of here, Dale. All right, brother. We want everyone to be safe, be careful, and always be aware of your surroundings. Because the next episode could be about you. This is The Crack House Chronicles. Chronicles.